All right. Um, so I'm going to start since I'm. Thank you so much for letting me moderate the panel. My name is Chloe McKenzie, and I'm the founder and CEO of Black Um So if you've seen kind of our donation box around. Uh, please feel free. give a donation. Our mission at Black Femming is to provide opportunities for women and girls of color to build and sustain wealth. Um, prior to really diving in head first in the nonprofit world, I was a mortgage trader. I tried to do it the right way, even though my boss was the head of mortgage trading at Lehman. Uh, somehow he got a job managing people who trade mortgages. But uh, once I kind of realized that I wasn't really helping me by doing that, I decided to go into the nonprofit world. Um, as wealth is such a difficult thing for people who look like me to attain, and not only attain, but then sustain. So um, that's pretty much been my life's work and continuing, hopefully, continuing to ride that wave for as long as I can. Um, but I'll start off here, so we're kind of talking about the finance and moolah space, or money space. Um, and so I wanted to do that from a different lens. So rather than talk about like, oh, like let's talk about capital structures and all things boring with finance, be a little more engaging and talking about how we can infuse our own personal stories into finance and money and capital structures and things like that. So uh, we'll start off with all of our panelists just introducing themselves, telling us kind of what they're about and how they get shit done. Hi everyone, my name is Kate. Okay. <laughs> My name is Kayla Michelle Jackson. I am a Rutgers student, senior right now. Uh, I like to think of myself as a change maker, as an impatient optimist. Um, I am the CEO of Kettle. We're a higher education crowdfunding platform. So think of us as Kickstarter for college tuition. Uh, but we facilitate the money directly from the campaign to the university. So there's complete donor transparency. Uh, there's cool features that help students optimize our, their campaigns uh, like any one, any of our competitors. Um, I guess how I get shit done is knowing that thin line between being active and being productive um, and also surrounding myself by people who are also getting shit done because it's really hard to be lazy when you have friends who are also getting shit done. So. Hello, everyone. It sounds like you're alone. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Suki Singh. Um, what do you do and why, why I'm about to? Really, the only question for me, as I, everyone gets out all the time in New York. So I'll answer it by saying um, I do broke management. If anybody's been broken here, um, meaning $10 in your pocket and don't know where your meal's coming from, I provide services to get you from there to wealth management to uh, a level where you can become financially free and take care of your family. Um, also, I'm a big quirky, I'm a good leader. Um, and uh, my company name is Investing, because um, my last name is S A N G H. You got that? Yes. Yeah, uh, so, um, Investing.ca is the website, and uh, I'm here to really empower people to take finances into their own hands and educate themselves and don't rely on uh, other people for their wealth, financial well being. Well -being. Hi everyone, I'm DK Smith. I'm the Managing Director of the Brooklyn Innovation Center. We have an accelerator and incubator program. But I'm also an angel investor. I'm a partner in an angel investor group from the West Coast. I do deal flow for angels, for family offices, and for venture capital firms. So what does it mean I'm the Managing Director of the Brooklyn Innovation Center? That means I work one-on-one -on -one with founders. Okay, I try to get founders from the, my idea is so great and wonderful to actually having a business. On the other side, I do deal flow for angels and VCs. You'd be surprised how many angels and VCs are actually looking for startups. They're one person. So I'm in Brooklyn. We have about 3 million people out there. I have a lot of people that come to me um, looking for startups, looking for companies to fund. We have uh, secured almost $3 million in funding outside of our own for our second and first wave of startups that came through the Innovation Center. So we're seeing a lot of success. One of our startups just closed $860,000. They started in December, and they've literally secured 860000 by July. Um, so uh, how do I get shit done? Making connections and education. Uh, educating founders, educating investors. It's, it's always education, no matter what. Um, different scale, different scope, but it's really education and making connections. So I'm here today to make connections. Hi everyone, my name is Trisha Tate. I'm a founder and president of Art and Money Matters. 
And um, I founded the company about three years ago um, out of my love for two things, um, for art, for all things creative, um, and also for money and all things technical. So I come from a corporate background. I went to school for finance, got my MBA, um, worked in corporate America at Merrill Lynch and Citigroup. And um, after the recession, I got the opportunity to follow my passion, a thing that I have been passionate about all my life which is dance, and so I auditioned for Broadway stuff, was on a Broadway national tour of Fela, and I've been with a dance company for nine years. Um, the, my mission for Art and Money Matters, and I may shift the name just a little bit, we can talk about that later, why I'm, why I'm shifting the name, um, but my mission is to educate, empower, and engage small business owners around numbers, so to provide the intelligence behind the numbers. And so because I have a little bit of the creative and a bit of the technical, I'm able to distill it in a real way. Um, so I am an outsourced bookkeeping and CFO management company for small business owners. Awesome. Um, so what I wanted to start off with is talking about value. Um, so kind of in the financial and money world, we always hear like, well, what's our ROI, our return on investment? Why, how do we even quantify or calculate qualified value? Um, and how we kind of infuse our own definitions of that. So at least in with my, my nonprofit, I always like to say, well, yeah, I take the money that we raise and invest it in women and girls of color to build and sustain wealth. Your return on investment is having a more productive economy, and that's what your ROI is. So my value is different. It's not necessarily that you need to make a return on investment in the traditional sense. So I just want to kind of to get to get more of a sense for people to see who you are. What does value actually mean to you? Is it in the traditional sense? How have your companies and endeavors uh, had you think about what value means? Um, I think that my personal uh, take on value is impact, right? How many kids are coming out of our platform? We, we're launching in January, but how many kids are coming out of our platform and thanking us for creating this platform, creating a pathway for them to get educated, right? Um, but at the end of the day, obviously, we're a venture funded company and our investor wants an ROI. They want some money, and that, that, that bottom line is important. Um, but the reason, the fuel, the reason that we do what we do is to make that impact so that a lot of people, especially young people of color who are coming from disenfranchised groups, low-income communities, have access to education, which will be making a smarter world, makes a more sustainable world. Um, and when we're more connected, we're, uh, we become a community, and then creating a community creates just a more sustainable society. Well, value for me um, is a bit different. Um, I, after having lost uh, a good amount of money, uh, six figures worth of money during um, a period of time in my life, I learned a lot about what value is. Value could be exactly, exactly like what the value of a dollar is, what we get with a dollar. However, to me, value is more about how you can uh, change and add value to somebody else's life. What does that mean? For example, as I meet many of you here today, you probably get an email from me saying, let's schedule a call to see what you're up to, to see how I can add value, whether that be through websites, through connecting people, through resources. So value to me is more of an intangible, and it's something that cannot be defined, because if I'm able to introduce you to that one VC investor for your startup, then it can totally change your life and you can make an impact on your company and many other lives in your community and the world around you. Oh, value for me. Um, I built and sold two companies by the late 90s, so if you would ask me you know, 15 years ago what value was about, that's what I would have told you it is. When I started writing checks to startups and investing, my ideas of value have kind of evolved and pivoted because I'm in Brooklyn. And in the time I left Brooklyn, I went to Boston and started my first company. I was in Atlanta and started the second company. By the time I came back to Brooklyn, about 300, 400,000 jobs had disappeared. And so I saw viable businesses in the area where I had bought a home that were gone. And when I asked around what happened to them, oh, well, you know, he wasn't doing enough business. And I realized that job, those loss of jobs, actually impacted, that's what trickled down, okay? The money didn't trickle down from wherever it comes from the super rich. The, the loss of opportunity trickled down. So my idea of investing has kind of moved more towards social impact, personal, personal investing. I'm interested in companies or startups that are gonna create jobs in Brooklyn. And why Brooklyn? I was born and raised in Brooklyn. 
Vets die, do or die. Okay? Yeah. Brooklyn Tech, Pratt Institute, that's home. Okay? Yeah. So, yep, thank you. Good, good. We got some homies in the house, okay? And, and I'm back in bed time. My sister convinced me to buy a home in bed time in the late 80s. It was the best thing I ever did. Um, so I, that's really where I'm about. That's what value is now. So tell me that you're going to create jobs. And it doesn't have to be a large number of jobs. We funded a two-person startup recently that it's not going to be a big company, maybe a couple of hundred thousand a year, but it's more than enough for those two people to have a wonderful life. That's job creation. It doesn't have to be 10, 20, 30. That's where I'm thinking. That's what I think of value now. It's so wonderful to be the last person to speak because then you get to really formulate your thoughts. So, with that said, um, uh, I think of value in three and three buckets. So, value to myself, value to clients, and then value to other people. So, as a small business owner, we spend a lot of time on the business, on clients, on marketing, on a lot of things that can stress you out and make you very tired. But I do value my time and I value giving, feeding myself because I can't feed anyone else or the business if I'm not feeding myself. And part of feeding myself is also being with my family, sharing time with family and friends. Um, it, creating value in terms of clients, I had a, I worked with a high-end custom rug designer. Um, he had one person managing his financial accounting stuff and I, I joined them based on a referral. And to have someone who is totally creative, like not interested in the numbers at all, look to me for his dashboard on a weekly basis that I created with like, here's your cash flow, here's the people that still owe you money, here's how much you owe, to, look for, to, to, to build up something that he looked for on a weekly basis that had something to do with numbers and for him to know that there was value in that was like really rewarding to me. So I like to have, I like working with small business owners because I feel like I can add value and impact to their lives by, digest, by, give, by uh, giving them actionable ideas through the numbers. And then the third thing is value to other people. I mean, I just met DK, I mean, whenever I meet someone, I'm automatically thinking, who else do I know that I can connect them to? And I'm part of a very large um, referral networking organization. And um, it just sort of is in alignment with who I am. Their motto was Givers Gain, if many, many of you might know what I'm talking about. Um, but I just met him and I already thought of three people that can help him without asking him for any money, right? And so I think it's important to give value to other people and somehow it comes back in return in some other form. Awesome, so just a quick time out. Uh, I do want to memorialize, this is probably the first panel I've been on or seen that is just all people of color, so that's a big deal, just gotta shout that out. Yeah. Um, before we move on from there, or as of, so we kind of talked about the end, right? So what is value now that we're thinking retrospectively? So let's take it back to the beginning. How did you all fund your endeavors? And we can start a little way at the end this time. How did you fund <laughs> your ideas? Um, talk about your capital raising, Concept that's that very easy. That's very easy. So I was just collaborating with a friend literally right before this, and we were talking about um, a, a workshop we're going to work on, and we were talking about people's financial mindset and money mindset. And I was thinking of the top five things that I want people to know about money, right? So you are your first investor as a small business owner. If you don't have skin in the game, who is going to invest in you? Who's going to buy your products? Who's going to buy your services? So I know I know a lot of people come from, and I'm not going to I'm going to say this with love, but I know a lot a lot of people come from not for profit university. So that means that the, the mindset where everyone's going to donate or grant you money. But I do believe that not for profits should also make money in order to serve their mission. And that's some earned income, so everything can't be donated. And I, and I move with that mantra, right? And so I believe that the first thing you have to do is invest in yourself. So everything that I do was funded from my personal accounts. Um, I saved money from working at my um, corporate jobs. And when the recession fell apart, then you know I was able to apply some of that savings to my small business venture. So I think it's important to always save for a rainy day, for an investment, a thought, an idea that you're that's burgeoning inside of you, so that you can put money and have some skin in the game from the beginning. Uh, I was in a Fortune 500 company, and I was at a level where I had a contract. So I decided to leave there, and I parachuted out, and I took their money. I did three things. I gave my mom a big chunk. 
I paid off my mortgage, and I decided I was going to go into business for myself and never work for anybody again. So I looked and I had about 18 months of my overhead covered and I had about 20,000 left and that's how I launched my first company. But I was very lucky, within two weeks I got Bank Boston as my very first client. And I looked at it in terms of horizon, we call it runway now. So I had 18 months of runway. Bank Boston job gave me another six months. Four months later I had State Street Bank and Trust. They became my biggest client for 10 years. So that gave me more runway. Well at the end of year one, I had the next three years of my overhead paid already in the bank. And so my metrics begin to change over time. Then I started looking at break even. Okay, how soon in the year do I break even? By the time I sold the company, we were breaking even in May. I was paying all my employees, two here in New York, me, myself, and seven in Boston. We were breaking even in May. So I sold that company. Then I had capital to start another company. I moved to Atlanta, started a multimedia firm. We got bought by an ad agency two years later. They just bought us out. It was like a wonderful thing. When I came back to New York, I was trying to figure out what to do, and Baby made three. Baby's a junior in college now. I had to find a new career. I got into technology. So I've been doing e-commerce since 98. Um, and the first thing I did in 2000 was I started a consulting firm. I was able to bootstrap that myself. And uh, my mentor is actually my partner in the uh, angel group. So he brought me into the angel investing out in Silicon Valley. So I've been lucky. I've been able to bootstrap. But it was about money management. I mean, it lucked up in terms of the business. It was you know, hard work, but it was always about money management. How far out in the future could I survive if nothing came in? And I thank God my mother for that because my mom was big on pay your bills on time, keep your credit together. So I'll leave you with this. You don't know how many startup founders I talk to and I say, well, you know, as part of the due diligence, they may want to check your credit rate. And they get that deer in the headlights look. It's like, well, who's going to write you a check for twenty-five or one hundred and twenty-five or three hundred thousand dollars if you can't manage money? Okay. So you know, you have this dream, and you meet this investor. Well, the day he says yes, it might be three or four months before you get the check. And it's called due diligence. So for any of you that want to start a business now, whether it's brick and mortar, whether it's a startup, whether you ever think you're going to need outside capital, get your financial act together. Um, when I was in the corporate world, I worked at the hedge fund operations of Goldman Sachs. And there I learned quite a lot about how to handle money from very high net worth money managers who would constantly be on the phone and they would have to, uh, they would have to really explain to the client what was going on with their money, what the status of their account was, whether they were losing, whether they were gaining, and all these other statistics. So. I learned a lot about how to really analyze and uh, lead people so that I can get on their good side in a way and how to break things down and communicate in such a way to, so that they will understand that um, I wasn't just squandering, you know, the portfolio manager wasn't squandering their money. So after learning that, I uh, went on to wealth management on my own when I broke out to another firm. and. I started with a very small amount of money on my own, and then I actively traded that in the market. However, that was a very small amount. So I actively had to go to networking events like these and add value to people first because they understand if you're being sleazy or trying to get a sale from them immediately because people have that intuitive sense. So if I'm constantly adding value to you in a number of other ways, personally or professionally, when it when that relationship eventually evolves, I can I can then maybe have an opportunity to speak to you about what I do. And again, that's coming from a genuine, authentic approach rather that rather than you know going up to someone and say, Oh, I'm a founder, because right now everybody's a founder and I can't stand that term anymore because I don't call myself a founder because I'm just me and I do what I do and with that the value you give to others that will come back. So when you go looking for money, you don't go looking for money. You go look to how you can how you can add value to the world, then the money will come to you. From whether it be VCs, whether it be credit cards, um, whether it be family and friends. And I, I think venture capitalists should be your last resort. Because as probably DK will tell you, they really are sharks in the shark tank. As some of you have seen the TV show. 
Yes, so to add to that point, uh, it was actually funny. My, my co-founders and I learned something very quickly, and that was as soon as you ask for advice, you get money, but when you ask for money, you get advice. Uh, so I, I've personally been raising money uh, through hustling, through networking, and through using my strengths. So my first company was in high school. It was um, an online magazine for the empowerment of young girls of color. Uh, since graduating high school, I sold that. And just getting the money to start that for the domain name, for the servers, uh, that was me picking up a janitorial job at my local high school. And that was something that I had to swallow my pride and do that because I wanted to do this magazine. I, and I didn't have the money, I didn't have a part-time job, I didn't have the money to, to buy the domain name and to, and to um, host our servers. So that was the example of hustling. Uh, for my company now, I use my strength. So I am a journalism major. I'm really good at that. I've had a million internships in the media, the media industry. Um, so I got us a few articles on my company, pre-launch, pre-revenue, still in the idea phase, got us some features in uh, publications. And so we got featured on a really cool website called Startup Panel, and a venture firm in Newark uh, called IDT, they're, they're also just an international telecommunications company. Their venture arm actually reached out to us from that article and said, come in and pitch. And we went in and pitched, and within 10 minutes, they said, we want to invest in you, we just have to do due diligence. So we actually really got lucky with that. But it was me using my strengths, me using the fact that I had a network in the media industry, um, and getting connected. So I think to everyone's point, it's also networking. It's coming out to these events, not being afraid to talk about what you do, but also not being afraid to add value to someone else. Because um, like you said, everyone's intuitive, everyone can tell if you're just trying to use them. And if you can't create value, often it's not going to come back to you. Definitely. And I think even there's a lot more commonalities between the for-profit and the non-profit side. Um, even one way that I kind of like to run my non-profit is as a for-profit. Just because I'm a non-profit, yeah, there's any IRS auditors in here don't listen. But yeah, at the end of the day, I get non you know tax exempt status, but that doesn't mean that I can't run my business like a for profit. Really, if I do it that way, I'm actually going to achieve more value to the people that I serve than than not. Um, so that's something that I want to discuss is how do you all begin thinking about your revenue models for your organizations and companies because at least in, in the nonprofit world, you have to constantly pivot, right? Where is the revenue actually coming from? You can think about it all day long, and then when you start getting those people to enter into your business and partner with you, then your revenue stream like tends to change. So talk about your revenue model when you were first building everything out, your business model, and talk about your revenue model now, and why why that changed, what you've learned from that. That's Sure. Right. Uh, so when we first started, it was just us taking the model that's already existent. So looking at GoFundMe, looking at Kickstarter, and seeing how do they charge. Um, and they charge a 5% commission fee on every donation that comes in. So we said, okay, we'll do that. We'll undercut them by 0.1%. So we charge 4.9%. And uh, that actually changed now. We still do take that commission fee, or we plan to when we launch. Um, but now we're looking more into advertising and data mining. So we know that there's a lot of uh, power in knowing where kids want to go to school and where they might want to go to school. So we say, you know, we looked at the metrics for you know, total U.S. Uh, university uh, budgets for, for marketing, and we say they've spent over five hundred billion, uh, five hundred million dollars on advertising alone. That's more than what Coca-Cola spends <laughs> in a year, right? So we're like, okay, we, we know where kids want to go to school. We know that there are kids who want to go to Penn State, but they, Rutgers wants to advertise to them and get, get them to go to Rutgers instead of Penn State. So we can sell that information to, to the university, therefore they hyper-target their audience. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with pivoting, a lot uh, to do with understanding your market, understanding your customer, um, and, and being comfortable with pivoting. Being comfortable with saying that you don't have to do it like everyone else. I'm coming from a traditional financial advisor background, and I was a financial advisor for a number of years, so um, if any of you do have financial advisors, um, I suggest you look at their statements, because most likely they don't have your best interests. That's just the way it is. It's not, uh, not that they're manipulative by any means, it's just the nature of the game, which means that 
most financial advisors have a model of the more sales you make, the more clients you get, the more assets, meaning money you have under management for you, you, you gain more salary. You take a percentage of the assets. Whereas me, I am more, I am, I use that model, but then I said, wait, is there some type of loophole, hopefully there's no lawyers in the room, that I can, where I can actually benefit the, uh, the client more, so actually get paid on performance. So most of my compensation now is based on performance. So if somebody ha can handles me, you know, get, opens an account with me and handles X amount of dollars, I manage that, however, most of it is, man is taken from the profits from that I generate for the client. So that's the tweak I made, and luckily I was able to do that um, using a few very smart hedge fund lawyers I know. Um, so that was a big key for me. However, after that I realized that people really want, I really want to empower people to do it themselves. There's no need for an advisor nowadays. Anybody who has a fifth, you know, a fifth grade education can do it themselves online with their own um, with their own accounts because nobody has the best interests at heart except you. I don't care who you are. I'm, and I'm talking about family as well because I know you love your family. I love my family, but sometimes I wouldn't give them a dollar sometimes. <laughs> So, um, and you're laughing because it's true. Um, so with that said, it's more about uh, me changing the model, which I did, and continue to evolve it into something that, um, instead of me working for you, we're working together as a common goal to create a legacy for your family, not just, oh, I'm gonna retire at 65, which is great, but what if you can retire a little bit earlier by saving a little bit more? Well, what if you can retire at, 55, that's a whole 10 extra years to spend doing something else besides working, if you don't like your work. Let's see, uh, I guess my practice is called multiple streams of income. I got into e-commerce in 98 doing SEO. I have, my corporate job was as a brand manager, so I have a marketing background. Um, so I got into e-commerce in 98 doing SEO. 2000, my NDA ran out, so I bought GetCustomers.com and I started an SEO firm. So I still own GetCustomers.com. We still have an SEO firm running there. About three years later, a lot of my clients were saying, hey, we're getting 10 times as much traffic, but we're not getting any more money. So I started looking at websites and kind of analyzing what was wrong. So I got into conversion. So we started doing SEO and conversion. Um, that became quote unquote digital marketing with social media. I own New York Digital Marketing. So that's my firm. I, set, I founded that. I got into WordPress in 2005, and I became a WordPress security expert when we got hacked in 2007, big time, because there was nothing to read on the web about what do you do when your WordPress site gets hacked. So I own WPSecurity.com. So I have these three companies that, you know, the, the key to them, I guess, is systems. Once you figure out what you're doing, if you document it right, you know, and you set it up right, then you can pass it on to other people. So I'm very fortunate that I have really good teams that I've been working with now, some of the people 16 years, 14 years. I might connect with the client, I might do a little business development, I might do the strategy, but then I can hand it off to them and they can follow the system and I can just look at it. The other thing is compensation. They get most of the money. Okay, I'm really happy to get 20 or 25% of something if I don't have to deal with it more than a day a month. So those three companies and some other small businesses that I have allow me the freedom you know, to go ahead and, and work with startups because in the startup world and angel investing world, you're really looking at a seven to 10 year horizon for a return. You know, If you get one sooner, you're really happy. I was just with a VC a week ago. He put his money into eight different companies in one vertical, but one went public recently. So he just said he got 100 times his money back on that one, but the other seven haven't done anything. So of course somebody had asked, well, you know, what's what's the key to being a successful, you know, venture capitalist? He said, when you get a hundred times return, I didn't know I was successful until that happened. So I've got investments out there in firms that some have fizzled, some are still going. But when am I going to get a return on that? So how do I survive in the meantime? It's the multiple streams of income that I don't have to put all my time in. And the key to that is systems, having systems in place, and compensating your people really well. There's never an argument about money. As a matter of fact, I've had my people say to me, DK, I really didn't do all that much when I'm handing them a check or telling them what they're going to get. So if you take care of your people and you have systems in 
place. You really don't have to worry about it. I don't worry about anybody cheating me. I don't check timesheets. I don't have to be bothered with any of it. Things just work. Things work. Um, I prescribe to the same university with multiple streams of income. Um, there is our Money Matters, which generates income from you know clients that I have that need me to do their books or um, uh, manage their finances, right? Um, and then there's Trisha Tate Incorporated. So you want me to speak? Pay me. You want me to perform? Pay me. So um, it's a, and and I talk whenever I talk about money, I also talk about the mindset around money. And a lot of people don't have a have a um, a tough time asking for what they're worth and knowing what they're worth. Um, so even I, and this is a good question because I'm at a place where I'm sort of shifting. So um, at a certain point in corporate America, I made a certain amount of money, and about. Three years ago, I made 10% of what that money was. I didn't have any pride or ego in that, but in that moment, I was like, I am accustomed to this kind of money. Why am I not asking for this kind of money when my education, my experience, and my background commands this kind of money? And so I started making a shift, even this year, and as a small small business owner, you have to allow yourself some space for that, for that, that discomfort, into confidence that I, I'm worth this amount of money. And so now I'm getting to a place where, I, where I'm shifting my, my, my pricing model from hourly to a retainer that continues every three months and I'm asking for your credit card up front so that there's a recurring stream of income. And so I'm working, I'm working on shifting that model, but anytime anyone engages me in anything, um, there's always a, a consultation up front, but you also have to figure out how you're gonna manage your time, right? So I wanna give away something for free, and, and I automatically do that. I talk all the time. I probably give away hours of advice. But then after a moment, I have to be like, are you, are you ready to engage? Here's what it will look like. And once you start talking money, everyone starts backing up a little bit, and I'm like, I just gave you a bunch of free advice. Like, I, I just gave you a lot. Um, so it's just about, it's about, um, uh, thinking about your worth, your worthiness, how much you're worth, where you are in the market in terms of your talent, your skill set, and your background, um, and then asking for it. That ask is a, is a big part, so, so asking for it. Um, and so that's how I determine my new revenue model, which is what? Multi multiple lines. Stream, multiple streams of income. Multiple streams of income. Yeah, I, I, want to, I want to follow up oh, with a really quick on, on the whole idea of asking for it. Since there's so many brown faces in the room, learn what white money is, okay? Learn what white money is. Because when you think you're getting a lot of money, okay, and, I, and excuse me if I say white generically here, I'm just making a big, you know, broad statement. But most times, you might think 50000 is a lot of money. You know, no. No, learn what white money is. When I learned how to charge fidelity, I actually did not get fidelity investments as a client because I didn't charge enough, okay? And my mother said to me, boy, what are you doing in business you don't know what to charge? So I went to some friends who had ad agencies and I learned that the same job that was $1,000 to the bank was five or 10 or 15,000 of fidelity just because they were fidelity. And that was the beginning of me learning and understanding white money. Okay. And I call it white money, I mean high-end money or super rich money, let's take the ethnicity out of it. So for people of color, you need to understand that, you need to learn that, find somebody who knows that. Okay, do not sell cheap, you're worth what you ask for, if you're good at it, you deserve it. And believe me, super rich white money doesn't go away when you say a crazy price. If they're interested and they've picked up the value, they will bargain with you. They won't go away, they won't go, oh that person's crazy, they'll say, that's oh, a little high if you've got, done a good perception of, your, of, of, sending, of giving them the value, so they perceive your value. Yeah. Learn that. That was exactly the point I was gonna make, even in the nonprofit world. When you go, so big news, but Capital, or Capital One just sponsored Black Gun, which is really huge because getting financial institutions to support having trust in communities of color for financial institutions is really huge. And the big thing that you go in is know who the cash cars are, the cash cows are. And yes, it happens to be the people who have CEOs that don't look like us. So you go into these meetings and say, what is, one of the person on my board of directors said, what do you want? 
And then he said, pick it up by 25%. That's what you're going to ask. Scared the shit out of me, but it worked. Because at the end of the day, again, it's the value. What's the value of What's their ROI that's outside of getting your money back? In the nonprofit world, let me put it this way. With Black Ben, you're an angel or a financial institution. I'm not giving you your money back. This money goes to women and girls of color who are poor, and we're teaching them how to trade stocks, bonds, mutual funds, currencies, all of these things, and you're not going to get your money back. But what you are going to get back is all of these things. Publicity. Man, wouldn't it be great to have a Capital One commercial where you've got a little girl who makes a pitch on why stock prices change? Hell yeah, and I've already got that done. We've got an animation. You can check it out on our website. Hell yeah, how many financial institutions get to see that, right? So knowing who the cash cows are and then upping what you were originally going to do. We do have to wrap it up. Um, so I have two questions, but we're only going to pick one. I do want to make a plug on an amazing book um, called Weapons of Math Destruction. Really awesome book by Kathy O'Neill. Um, she's brilliant. If you don't know about big data and what it's doing to fuck with you, read this book. It's absolutely phenomenal. If you're a big audible re uh, it's like uh, e-books, or sorry, listening book books you listen to, I just listen to it. It is phenomenal. I mean, I can't believe how many models there are out there that totally, they're, you know, you think about your credit score, well, there's actually something called e-scores. And basically, if all of your Facebook friends are in this, they'll find your IP address, and they'll see what zip code you're from, and then these firms, they'll like kind of send out the ad, no friends to my marketing friends, but it's unbelievable what information is just out there. So, in other words, get Facebook friends that with rich people, because then it's gonna somehow help you out in the e-score world. Anyway, um, so it was gonna be a question on big data, but I wanna end with this, because I put a little star, because I was like, you know, maybe not everybody on the panel is gonna be a person of color, but now I can ask this question. What is the hardest thing for you being a person of color, being in the finance space. If you could talk about maybe a horror story that we all probably know, being in these kind of meetings with institutions that we're getting money from or partnerships from, but what has it been for you? And then I will you know, scale it up a little bit for the women of color on this because we have to deal with the double vulnerability of being a woman and black. Um, and so what has it been for you? What has been your experience? What's been the hardest thing for you? Uh, being a person of color in this space. Okay, so yeah, so I have a funny story. Um, so I'm obviously new to, not the startup world, but definitely to ed tech um, and to venture capital uh, fundraising and angel investment fundraising. And I went into a room one day, uh, this is definitely in part to the, the disenfranchised um, uh, characteristics that I have. I walk into a room with one of my advisors from my venture capital firm who is a white Jewish man. Uh, we went into an angel investment pitch and the first thing that the angel investor did was greet David Dibber, who was the, the white Jewish man. Um, and I guess he mistook him as the co-founder and he only looked at him and talked to him for the first 15 minutes. And I'm sitting there saying, hi. <laughs> This is my company. This is my company. I am. I, my CEO is not here. I'm the COO. I am representing my company, and I would like to begin the pitch now. And he was mind blown. He was like, "Are you serious? Like, I thought David was the co-founder. No, you didn't. You knew he was. He was the one introducing us. Uh, you just didn't expect for a black woman to be doing this and to have already had venture funding." Uh, so I think the the biggest challenge is kind of establishing yourself as that authority. Um, and I definitely learned in that moment in time that I shouldn't have waited the 15 minutes. I was being too nice. I should have said as soon as he had, as soon as he said the first word to David, I should have said, hello, my name is Bill Dykes, I'm the CEO of Pedal, and I'm ready to begin this pitch. How are you? And then go on my spiel. Um, so, so again, establishing yourself as authority, um, as an authority, establishing yourself as someone who knows what they're talking about, who's been through this before, um, and making sure that they don't trample all over you. Just because you're a black woman in FinTech and EdTech does not mean that you do not bring value. I can say to them, I launched and sold the company before I graduated high school. David Hibbert just started working for IET last year. Mm -hmm. So talk to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you obviously say it in a, in a kind of tone, <laughs> um, but definitely establishing yourself as an authority and not letting somebody walk all over you, especially as a woman. Especially as a woman. When I first interviewed 
with Goldman Sachs, that was probably very scary for me. I uh, remember getting advice from my dad before the interview, and he has a saying in my language saying that, um, what he said to me was this, he said, why are you so afraid? They are just men like you, men and women, meaning they're human. They're not, they're, they're, a God isn't there. So you're just like them. So that made me feel a little bit better until I walked into the building, which was gorgeous in the downtown Jersey City area, which was built, the building was built like Fort, Fort Knox, so it was, uh, which would stand uh, bomb explosions, terrorist attacks, and going into that building, I, was, I said, wow, I really made it. I'm gonna be interviewed. That was my life, that was my vision since I was in college. And my first interview went really well. However, I was so nervous that when I uh, shook the inter uh, interviewer's uh, hand, I trembled like this. And I don't think, luckily, I don't think she noticed it, which was great. And then I said, okay, they'll, they'll give me two weeks and call me back for another round. And another round came after two weeks. And I was like, yes, second round, this will be it, after this is done. No, I went on five other rounds. And these, from interviewers who weren't even in that department, they were just, I guess, behavioral type of, um, behavioral like psychologists, if you will, because they were in the behavioral finance department, which they just created at that time, so lucky for me. Uh, and with that, uh, luckily I did get the job, and it was just, the first week it was very, very scary until I saw the people around me, and the majority of people were all minorities. And I said, wait, what's going on? I was in the operations department, and these are people highly educated, and I was like, oh wow, this is interesting. However, then, later on, with my work there, I go into the training school for a bit. However, the majority are all white males. So seeing that contrast, I really thought about where my place was, not in the company, but in the world. So I decided, you know what? I'm not gonna fit in just to that department. I can, I can, I can grow, I don't have to be in I could be in any department I want. So I managed to get to the training uh, on the trading floor, which is great because I learned so much. And one thing also I want to bring up was that use your ethnicity to your advantage. A lot of people do not. Um, if I was a female, I would be doing so many things. <laughs> get money, it would still be obscene. No. What was that? How, within reason, yes, however, to, to get my foot in the door, like another panelist was saying, I'm not sure if she was here, she said, use your femininity to get your foot in the door, and then wow them with your presentation, with your pitch. Because your, your looks are going to fade away. So, use your ethnicity to your advantage, whether that be your, um, your looks or whatever that may be. But for me, I'm very quirky, as you can tell. So, people gravitate towards that, like, oh yeah, that was a funny Indian guy, yeah, funny Indian guy. So, um, with that said, um, also, I would like to offer, uh, I would like to uh, ask DK for a job, so you can pay me. You're on the spot, DK. Sorry, we do have to... Oh, sorry, uh, for me, I'm always working above my comfort zone. Um, you know, once I get comfortable with something, once I've got a system and it's working, I kind of get bored. And so I'm constantly moving above my comfort zone. So for the last six to eight months, I've been working with venture capital firm. And I was just telling John, uh, I, I wake up sometimes 2.30 in the morning because the words fiduciary responsibility come to me. <laughs> Meaning, it's one thing when I write a check. I mean, the money, I, I didn't just, you know, I worked hard to get the money, and so I'm very cautious about writing checks. But now I'm advising other people with other people's money. And, you know, we always do that, hear that term OPM, use other people's money. Well, when you're the person who's kind of advising and or, you know, say, write it to these people, it's a different level of responsibility. And quick story, when I had my first business, I was in the bank one day, and I heard these two guys go, hey, John, hey, Jack, how you doing? You know, da da da, da. Well, I heard your business went out, and yo, oh, yeah, you know, what happened? Well, the location wasn't so good. Well, what are you doing next? Come see me when you need a business loan. You know, if you need a line of credit, I'd love to finance you. 
And at that point, I whipped around. And of course, it's these two ruddy-faced New England white men. Because I knew damn good and well, if I went out of business, I was not going to get invited to get another line of credit. I was not going to get another, you know, I mean, I, I literally bought a facility on a line of credit. My banker said, oh, it'll take a couple of months to get a mortgage now. I'll just give you a line of credit so you can buy the building in cash. I knew that if I failed and didn't make those payments, it wasn't going to happen for me again. So now I still, as much as I've had success, and of course some of the startups haven't worked on the angel level, now that I'm moving up into this venture level, I still feel like I better get it right. Because this is my shot. And if I F it up, I'm not going to get another chance. And that's why. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I'm going to find out. But every once in a while, 2.30 in the morning, you can, you can ring me up. I'll be thinking about that. <laughs> I love opportunities, let me not say I love. Um, I have learned to finesse opportunities when I'm the only black or one of few in the room. I don't shy away from it, I'm accustomed to it now. And when you become accustomed to it, then you know how to finesse it. Um, I went to a, a boarding school, Phillips Academy Andover. I went to Wharton, undergrad, one of few blacks in a finance class. I went to Duke for my MBA and then I worked on Wall Street. So for all intents and purposes, I've been a minority in like the past 16 plus years of my life. So I'm accustomed to being that. Um, so whenever I see somebody try to undermine or dismiss me, I love to throw my eight and a half by 11 resume in their face and have them be like, oh, you went to Andover? My friend did so and so. It's like, yes. So and so, I did. And so now, can you hear me? Can you hear Trisha Tate? And now, can you not look at black girl? Right? So I welcome those opportunities. I love, I call it shock and awe. I love the shock and awe in your face. And I only pull it out when I recognize the person is trying to undermine or dismiss. I am a very humble person from Brooklyn, with Caribbean background, and very natural here. So I'm a, I'm a very understated person, but if you need me to tell you who I am. I, was, I went to Wharton, and I co-founded the affinity group called the Wharton Arts Network. I'm on the executive board, what would you like to say? So if you have that in your resume, use it to your advantage. And on that note, <laughs> 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 <laughs>